My name is Rory Barnes. And uh, what do you do? I'm a professor of astronomy, astrobiology, and data science at the University of Washington. All right, and are we alone? I don't know. Okay, when I asked you that question, what did you understand by the word we? Uh, I meant this planet, uh, the life on this planet, if it's uh, alone in the universe. Okay, and uh, are viruses alive? Uh, it's a good question, I don't know. So when you said the word life on this planet, you weren't quite sure what that meant? Uh, no, I, yeah, there are obviously life is a difficult uh, thing to, de to define. Okay, but the, not obviously, but <laughs> it is a difficult thing to define. So you think the answer is you don't know, but why don't you know? What what is what part of that question is the most uh, questionable? Which one? Viruses being alive? Or no, are we alone? Are we alone? Which why is that the hard question to answer? Well, the, first of all, uh, as we just discussed, I mean, life is a difficult thing to define, so it is hard to discover that in the universe. Mm -hmm. um, and second of all. It's a great big universe, and it's been hard to explore it all, so we just don't, I think, have the proper data to answer that question. If we found bacteria-like things on Mars, would we be alone? I would say no. Some people say yes. Probably. Because they'd like to talk to things, and they think that, you know, who cares about bacteria? I wouldn't find something that I can talk to. Sure, of course. But, uh, yeah, I think that the big question for me is, is there other, are there other worlds in the universe that possess life. And so for me, if there were being bacteria on Mars, that would mean the answer to that question is no, we are not alone. How about viruses on Mars? Well, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just not a virologist, so I, I don't really know how to answer that question precisely, but I would certainly be intrigued if that were there. But, but, but if it's the case that life evolved from non-life, then we might find every example of everything in between on some other planet, and then you'd have to answer this. Well, you did try to answer sure. this question, are we alone? You said, well, I don't know, because I don't know whether that's quite what I consider life. Well, my understanding of viruses is that they require single-celled organisms to reproduce, so to speak. And so I would think that would imply the presence of other forms of life that I think most people would agree are life. So I would be very intrigued, but I would certainly want to find those other organisms that they might be uh, living through. OK, uh, is the question, are we alone, an important question? I think so. Because? I think it's important because I think either way, whether the answer is yes or no, it's a profound outcome. Whether or not there is some galactic civilization out there that we are unaware of, I think that probably humanity would like to be a part of that. Um, it certainly would be a, a civilization that would be something that would be able to influence life on our planet. And so I think it would be valuable to know if it's out there. On the other hand, if the answer is no, that this is it, this is the only planet in the entire universe that can support life, then I think that means we really need to take very good care of this planet. And so it's profound either way, uh, whether or not there is a whole universe teeming with life or whether this is it. Are, are you particularly interested in human-like intelligent life? Sure. I mean, that certainly would be amazing to discover intelligent life in the universe. Aren't you worried that it would kill us? Sure. I mean, there's that possibility. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to extrapolate from human activities to uh, the universe, and who knows how other forms of life have uh, developed intelligence and culture. So sure, there's certainly the possibility that that, would, that could happen, but... Now, now so you know. think the question, are we alone, is important, but there are a lot of people who don't think this is an important question. They just go out living their lives, and, and why do you, do you think thinking about the question, are we alone, makes you a better person or something? Or what, no, no. why is it important for you and, 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 and yet so unimportant for so many people? Well, so I think it's important because I see in the long run answering this question being very transformative to society and something that I hope, like I, you know, I hope, um, I assume it will be something that brings uh, humanity together. I think it's, you know, if we find alien life out there, I think the differences between human beings will seem much more negligible, <laughs> and it, we will feel much more like a family. So maybe I'm optimistic and hopeful there, but I do think that should we find it, uh, it will transform our society in a good way. Uh, uh -huh. But I completely understand why many people think that it's a waste of time, because in our day-to-day -day life, it's not something that matters or is important, um, but it's something that I think in the long run could be a great benefit to humanity. So you're in this astrobiology business for human unity. I wouldn't say that. Um, it's part of it. Um, I'm in it for human unity, but I also uh, just enjoy the discovery. I enjoy thinking about this. I, I think that science is the greatest story ever told, and I think that we're a part of it. And I enjoy being able to use my brain to 
make sense of this crazy universe we live in. Now, so I, I agree with you about, you know, what's a wonderful story, the like scientific story of Genesis, but I, I would guess most people in the world do not share our opinion about this. What, what do you say to those people? How do you convince them that <laughs> we're right about scientific Genesis is the truth and that's the way you should believe and get rid of your ancient superstitions or whatever? Well, I, I don't know that I say, think that they should get rid of their ancient superstitions. I think, you know, I'm, I'm a little more, I don't know what the word is, but I, I think that people should find their points of views that makes them happy and find fulfillment in life. I just personally think, think that science is a way that of thinking and exploring the universe that fulfills me and makes me happy. So I don't think I need to impose my value system on anybody else. So you're else. not a missionary for astrobiology? No, by no means. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I mean, if people want to talk about it, I'm happy to talk about it. I do, you know, go out to, into the other parts of Washington State, for example, and introduce astrobiology to kids. I think it's important to, for people to be aware of these other alternative ways of thinking from what they might be believing in. But by no means do I think everybody has to find this to be the end all be all. So you're not out thought. to convince people that the scientific story of how we got here is the most important one? No, I would rather them come to them their conclusion on their own. I'd like to present the facts and the stories and the data um, and people need to come to their own conclusions because I don't think science is the uh, all there is in, in, in life. <laughs> yeah, there's certainly a lot of things that I don't think science can explain. So do you think it makes you a better person to have insight into how you got here? to have such an examined, scientifically examined life, um, as opposed to the Rory Barnes who didn't think about how we got here? <laughs> um, I guess so. I don't know. I don't really think of it in those terms. Um, I just try to uh, enjoy what I'm doing on it every day. I, I don't think about it being a better person. That's a strange <laughs> way to put it, in my opinion. <laughs> okay. Well, it must add something to your life to have this view of how you got right. here. Right. Well, so I th when you say a better person, I, I think okay. that you're, just making, it, that just you're making it relative to other people, right, and that's right, not right. how I right. judge right. it. I just, I make, I think it's, I am happier as a person doing this than I would be if I were not. And is it because you have a deeper understanding of how you got here? I think so. I think it helps me understand how I fit into this universe. Uh, you know. There, it's such a huge universe with so much crazy things, so many crazy things out there that I have often wondered, if, starting from as a small kid, you know, how do I fit in? What is, how do I fit into this crazy universe? But, and, and I think that going through science has helped answer some of those questions but for that me. that does sound a little solipsistic in the sense that the story that you tell about how you got here is also how I got here, how that person got here, whether they know it or not. Sure. And you don't feel compelled to say, hey, by the way, I can tell you how you got here. <laughs> well, I don't necessarily know I know. I don't necessarily know how they got here, right? Astrobiology is trying to answer that question of how did we get here, and we don't know the answer. That's why it's a compelling question right now. So I don't think that I know the answers to that. I just know that it's, it's fascinating and it's fun to think about that and, and, make some, and make some small progress in understanding it. Yeah, speaking of small progress, what part of your research contributes to answering this question, are we alone? Yeah, so my research is about simulating the formation and evolution of planets, especially those that might be habitable. And so uh, we try and bring together uh, a lot of different physical models that have been developed throughout uh, many disciplines of science. And so we're generating a, a clearer picture of how planets can form that would support what life and how those planets might evolve over billions of years. So I think it helps us uh, identify which planets and moons might be viable targets to search for life, hopefully narrowing our search down and bringing us to answering some of these questions more quickly. Well, do you think we as a community astrobiologists will find life? Well, I guess it depends if it's out there or not, right? Um, I don't know. Um, so you don't know whether it's out there or not? I don't know whether it's out there or not, right? Uh, so but it's that hard sounds to answer like a question. gold digger who doesn't know if there's gold out there, but you keep digging. Right. So if the answer, if the question is, what does my gut tell me is life out there? The answer is yes, I think it is out there. Um, but as I said before, whether it's out there or not, I think it's a profound question to answer. Okay, since your gut knows how to answer this question, but your head doesn't, <laughs> let's ask your gut. Okay, gut, <laughs> where did your gut feelings come from? Just from the sheer size of the universe, just that there are whatever, 10 to the 24 stars in the universe, so probably a similar number of planets. It just seems like there's a lot of environments out there in the universe where this sort of physical chemical system that we call life could have developed. So your gut th thinks we're not alone, but your head says, wait a minute, gut, 
maybe life is really hard and therefore those big numbers might not turn into life. My gut has been wrong before. So <laughs> no, I, your brain has too. <laughs> yeah, my brain has definitely been wrong too. <laughs> okay, well, if I gave you a hundred billion dollars uh -huh. with the caveat, you have to spend this money to answer the question, are we alone? Or to help answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? What's my time frame? Whatever you want, hundred billion dollars. Well, no, what, how long do I have to? I'll give it to you right now. No, 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 I mean like, when do you want an answer by? <laughs> when, when can you provide one? Well, right. So I don't want I think, an answer. I want I think you to help. It's, it's, so if you want it from me, you're, the time frame is my lifetime, in our okay. lifetime, right? So then I would definitely look in the solar system. Um, and that's because I think that it'll be challenging in the near term to uh, be able, even with $100 million, billion dollars, excuse me, to build a telescope that would convince me that any sort of atmospheric signal we're seeing from an, uh, from an exoplanet is in fact due to life and not some sort of obscure geochemical process that nobody's ever dreamt of. But in the solar system, you know, we can go there, we can get ground truth, we can actually find life and hold it and bring it in our lab. So I would, I would focus that $100 billion on the solar system just because in the next 25 to 50 years, I, don't, I think that's where we have the best chance of actually answering that question. Well, let's not constrain it to your lifetime. Okay. Let's just say you're, I don't know, you're the holder of the $100 billion, and we, <laughs> not necessarily in your lifetime. How would you, would you save any of it to, or, or to build this telescope that you mentioned would not be capable of being built in your lifetime? Well, I'd have to think about what sort of <laughs> telescopes are possible with $100 billion. Um, yeah, that's a difficult question to answer, of course, because it's hard to know what really can be done with would, $100 billion. Would you spend any of this money on, I don't know, electron microscopes to look for nano-aliens? Nano-aliens? Uh, you mean on Earth? or yeah, yeah, around here. They're in this room. Yeah, they're Tiny in this room. Tiny little things that are in this room that we don't know about from an alien civilization. I, that's a... I haven't thought of that before. I'd have to think about it more carefully. <laughs> I don't know. I wouldn't, make, I wouldn't make a rash decision with $100 billion like that. Now... Uh, do you think that we're inside, you know, your brain cells, they're inside your head. Yes. But I think they don't know they're part of you. <laughs> Do you think that we could be part of an alien in some analogous way? Um, I suppose that's possible. Uh... <laughs> Would you spend any of your hundred billion to try to investigate that? Probably not. <laughs> and, and you wouldn't buy any electron microscopes to look for nano aliens? Not in this room, necessarily. I would, you know, maybe for bringing samples back from Mars or Europa to look at them more carefully, but I wouldn't really be looking for a shadow biosphere in, on Earth if that's what you're getting at. Would you try to send us, like, the Starshot mission to try to send something to Alpha Sen? Or? That's an interesting question. Um, I certainly think that that's a, a, a fascinating idea. Um, and I do think that it is, as I alluded to before, uh, in searching through the solar system, I do think physical presence is a valuable thing in confirming that life is there. I mean, especially because we don't have a firm definition of it. It's sort of one of those things where we know when we see it. And so just seeing its uh, fingerprints, so to speak, in an atmospheric spectrum is, I think it's going to be tricky. There will always be people that will deny it and believe, disbelieve it. But if you can bring it back to Earth and people can actually see it, I think that changes the game. What do you think of SETI? I think that he's a valuable part of the search for life. Yeah. Why? Because uh, there's a, it's. I think I see it in terms of numbers and distance. So one of the reasons why I like the solar system is because it's close by and we can actually physically go there. But there's a very limited set of worlds, um, set of you know compositions. Whereas SETI ha can play the numbers game and just look at hundreds of millions of stars potentially and, and environments for life. So I think that it's worth it to look for you know, the needle in the haystack, as, as they like to say, um, because you know, there's just so many numbers out there that if there is a planet out there, we might be able to spot it. Um, now, Arthur C. Clarke, I think, said, uh, you know, any sufficiently advanced civilization would be indistinguishable from magic. Yep. But there's this guy, a Canadian-German guy called Schroeder who said, no, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. And I suppose this guy is more of an ecological conscious guy, and he thinks that if you're an advanced civilization, you uh, are more compatible with nature. You don't cut down forests, rather you are, you're, sure. it's sustainable. What do you think of that comment? I think that's a really good, nice way to say it. I hadn't thought of that or hadn't heard that comment before, but 
Yeah, you know, I think about the long term a lot. You know, just that I don't think that cities and the way that humanity is engineering our planet is a sustainable setup. That there has to be some way to coexist a bit more with the natural forces on on our planet. So um, I do think that, that that's a, an interesting way to put it. I, I do agree, though, that indistinguishable technology would be no different from magic as well. I think. You know, if I handed my smartphone to somebody who lived 200 years ago, that would appear to be magic. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we do need to make sure that we are in a sort of equilibrium with the natural forces on the planet. So I could see how some people would argue that being, uh, it would be indistinguishable from nature. That's a, a fascinating way to put it. For some people, intelligent aliens are much more important than bacterial analogs. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Do you think if we replayed the tape of life, I mean, do you think once you have life on a planet, do you think it evolves towards what one might call intelligent life? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, you know, we have the one example again here on Earth. Um, but at the same time, I think we are seeing on Earth, people are starting to clue into the fact that there are species on this planet that we have to describe as intelligent. They use tool, they use language. Um, so it does seem that that is uh, a natural tendency of at least complex life. Of course, you have to get to complex life, and it's not clear how often that happens. And uh, so, you know, and I, the other one I think about is that brain sizes generally tend to grow over time as you look uh, through the fossil record. So it does seem that brain size at least is growing, and it, uh, and, I, and it does seem that when you look at animals, that they do seem to have some sort of cognitive ability. So it does. So. I would say, I guess, I would lean towards it's likely, but I don't know that it's, I can't, so I wouldn't go any farther than that. Well, do you have any favorite solutions to the Fermi Paradox? <laughs> I have many favorite solutions okay. to the Fermi Tell Paradox. Tell me your top two. My top two, uh, okay, my top two are that it's early days in the universe, that the universe is only 13 billion years old, but yet stars will probably burn for tens of trillions of years longer, so it's just, we're just early. We it's are, called, we're, we are the first, or one yeah, of the first. Yeah, we're the, one of the first, so, and I think when you just, you know, obviously people don't like that theory because it does mean we're at a special time, but we have to recognize we are at a special time. It is early in the history of stars in the universe. We are just, we are in a young universe. Um, so that's one of them. Um, so I have to pick a second. <laughs> I have so many, Charlie. You're going to make oh, two pick. is all, okay. <laughs> yeah, We can go all day, right? Um, I guess my other, my, my other scientifically motivated one really is that I think there's a lot of water worlds out there, and so it's very difficult to harness fire and electricity on a water world. And so I think there's probably lots of water worlds that have, well, I should say, I, shouldn't, I think it's possible that there are habitable worlds out there that have life on them, but they just have no means of communicating. So let me ask your stomach, since it believes that yeah. there is life out there. <laughs> Let's do a fraction of the planets with life that don't have telescopes and the fraction of life that does have telescopes. And what does your stomach what say What is that ratio? That? Yeah, what is that ratio? Is that one in a million, one in a billion, one in two? <laughs> um, certainly not one in two. Um, yeah, I would have to say it's more, maybe at the one in a million or lower level. Okay. Um, well, maybe not that. I don't know. Yeah, that's a hard question to answer. Well, when your favorite solution to the Fermi Paradox was where it's early days. Yeah. So we're one of the earliest or the earliest technological civilization mm -hmm. to evolve. Now, I call that the uh, we are first solution. Yeah. Now, you, I guess you have to apply that to Earth as well to explain why there are no other species that have made yeah. radio telescopes. Right. So it's, you're invoking we are first. And uh, don't you feel any qualms about that? Sure. As somebody who statistically <laughs> analyzes data. Sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, you know, but at the same time, there was, you know, we can look at our, our own planet and understand why some, you know, at least come up with some reasons as to why life, to, intelligent life took a while to evolve, sort of, you know, well, the, or maybe that's not, that's not your question. Doesn't, I, I, I characterize you as a somewhat humble person, and it <laughs> seems like a very unhumble point of view to think that you're the first. I mean, anybody who says, there are a lot of people who think, hey, I'm the only one who talks to God, or I'm the only one who yeah. do this. And usually they're crazy, <laughs> or, or very, very crazy. vain. Right? Yeah. So you I, asked why uh, I'm okay with it, us being first when... Yes, okay, so I, I assume I characterize you as a humble person, and yet you are happy with what I consider to be a rather vain attitude of, hey, we are first, and that's the best explanation for our uniqueness as the only telescope-building 
uh, species on the planet and possibly to explain the, the Fermi paradox. Well, I wouldn't call it vain. I mean, it's just dumb luck. <laughs> right, we're just here. Dumb you know? luck. I mean, yeah, I mean, it just happens to be that's where we are. And so, so, but there's another explanation for that, and that is that it's quirky and it's unlikely, and it's just a, a, that's our particularity that would not necessarily mean. See, when you say the word first, you're assuming that there's a directionality that's com that's universal, rather than okay. the quirkiness of our particular evolution. Well, I don't see the distinction so clearly. I guess I think that it's a matter that somebody has to be first and. I don't know that we are first, but I, you know, it's obviously life. Well, I shouldn't say obviously, but it doesn't appear that life is all around us in the universe. But why do you say if somebody has to be first? Does there have to be a first invention of English language in the universe? Uh, I mean, we're the first, sure. probably the first invention of it. But I would to say, say that, that we're first means there's going to be a second. Now, I doubt there's ever going to be a second <laughs> yeah. invention of English language. Well, so you see how inappropriate that language is for yeah, the language. You're, yeah, you're getting to the semantics here. <laughs> well, I think it's an important part of semantics. That's why I'm... So, all right. So I guess your argument is that there could be other chemical systems that we might call life, but that they're nothing like ours. And so by saying we were first, that that somehow diminishes their... Uh, status as becoming a sentient species somewhere in the universe? Well, I would say that any, I guess I would say that humans are unique just like every other species. Is what sure, I would say. yeah, yeah. And, but, that, <laughs> the, but that precludes the use of the language we're first. If you're unique, that doesn't mean you're, you're first. Everybody's first of what okay. they are. It's like this is the first African sure. elephant in the universe. Sure. But that doesn't mean but it's a silly thing because there's no we don't expect a second African elephant to evolve. That's why. Yeah, that seems like semantics to me. I don't okay. really see <laughs> see I mean if if we believe if we can come up with a common definition of life mm -hmm. then it evolves somewhere first in the universe. I mean right, but just, we're now we were talking about electro we're talking about telescope making. That's a little very... Okay, is that what you were getting at? Well, that's what we were talking about, about okay. the, the unique evolution of, of species intelligence who can produce a radio telescope and then communicate. Because uh -huh. right? that's how, what you need to answer the Fermi paradox, right? Okay, right. So your question then is, maybe you could restate it for me then, okay, but now that you've prefaced well, that. Well, when you say your favorite solution to the Fermi paradox is essentially saying we're first. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, that's how you explain the non-existence of other species on Earth that haven't produced radio telescopes. But when you say we're the first, it's pre it, it, it marginalizes the idea that you are unique and everything else is unique, and that's more or less the attitude I would take. Okay, yeah. so I guess when I think of the Fermi paradox, I think of how Enrico Fermi phrased it, which is, where are the aliens? Right. Which doesn't mean right. that they are looking at us and finding us, just that, where are they? So to me, a lot of it is just, can we find them? <laughs> you know? Well, I thought it was like, they're, if they're technological and the galaxy is so small and you go one-tenth the speed of light, then you could colonize the galaxy within about, I don't know, a million sure. years or so. Yeah, well, there's different ways of, of course, there's different levels of the Fermi paradox, but I guess what I just mean is that you know, there it is. Like I said, you know, this we're in the first point oh one percent or whatever of the lifetime of stars in our universe, and so it is quantitatively it is early. If we believe that life forms around on planets orbiting stars, then there is a lot of time left, fractionally speaking, in for life to develop elsewhere in the universe. So it's it's just early. It's you know. I mean, have you ever seen a UFO? No. What do you know about aliens? I don't know anything about aliens. Have you ever been abducted by aliens? <laughs> no, I have not. What kind? Now, let's talk to your stomach again. Forget okay. your brain. Close your eyes, please. <laughs> All right. I'm going to talk to your stomach. Uh, what it's kind of aliens would you like to find? Delicious aliens. Delicious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. That was my stomach talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's talk to your emotional part of your brain. Then. Um, so I would like, I guess, intelligent life would be the most fascinating. Because? Well, I think that it would be fascinating to understand what other intelligent species feel about life in the universe and what or life not just life in the universe but I mean this existence of life I should say when physicists say that they say oh I want the aliens to tell me the answers to you know the grand unified theories etc and they're all sure happy because they want, it's kind of like asking God to, can you tell me what yeah. the solution to this equation is other people think that there are bigger more important moral issues moral, about yeah. how to get along are you a, you're a mixture of those I'm too? a mixture of those yeah okay. all right um, 
Now, I think Carl Sagan once said that we are the way for the universe to be conscious of itself. What do you think okay. of that? Well, that sounds vain <laughs> to me, <laughs> right? I think that that's uh, attributing a lot to uh, an importance in humanity that I don't attribute it to. I think it's our consciousness is just uh, somehow a, a natural byproduct of evolution. So, I mean, it's the, evol the universe exists, and it's just we are a part of it, and it is some function of matter that it is able to collect itself in a way that allows thought and rationality and logic to to appear. And I don't know if that means that we guess, are the I, I we guess, are. Oh, go ahead. I guess Carl Sagan thought that that ability was a fantastic thing that. Uh, that's going to happen in the universe, and we're the way that that happens. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't you, don't, know. you don't have that grandiose vision of human consciousness, then? I don't, no. Okay. Now, have you seen the movie Contact? I have not. Okay. Anyway. Oh, wait, no, no, I did see Contact. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, in this movie, several times, uh, somebody says, well, are we alone? And the answer is, well, if we are, it would be an awful waste of space. Uh -huh. What do you think of that comment? Uh, I don't know. I don't, it doesn't seem like a waste of space to me, I guess. Uh, so for, there's a lot if we're of, alone, it's not a waste of space for you? No, I don't think so, because there's a lot of fascinating things out there. I mean, we, we learn a lot about the universe by looking at it. So, I mean, I, I don't know. It's, again, it's, that's a judgment that I don't know that I ascribe to the universe. I think, I guess if I were to think about, for my own personal self, as an astronomer and astrobiologist, I find that space to be fascinating because... I learned about neutron stars and other planets and black hole mergers and, you know, that's just, that space has to exist at some level with this distance in order for a place like the Earth to exist and be habitable. I mean, I don't, I think that's, but I don't if, know what's the word. If you I, thought life was the most important part of the universe, then you would probably agree with that judgment. No, because no? the universe has specific physical rules and if, oh wait, oh, I guess I see what you're getting at. You're, yeah, yeah, so um, if there is no other planet that has life, then uh -huh. it's a big waste of space. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I guess what I, where I was going was that, you know, the physical laws of the universe require there to be great distances between uh, stars and planets. So I don't see that space as wasted because it, you need to have gravitational constants and fine structure constants with certain ratios to allow that enormous distance between worlds to exist. But you're asking the more fundamental question of if there are many, many billions or 10 to the 24 planets out there and only one of them has life, is that a waste of space? Hmm. I don't know. I guess it just seems like it, you know, at some level it would be fine and, and exciting if there was a lot of life out there. But if not, it's either way. It's like I said before, whether life is out there or not, that answer is profound, and it tells us something about our existence. And it, whether so, if if there is no life out there, then those planets are telling us something really important. And so, it's not a waste. It's just a matter of looking at it in the right way to understand how it informs your decisions uh, on how you live your life. So, you think life is important because its existence or non-existence elsewhere is profound? Well, in some sense, but I would also I think it's profound in the sense that it helps us as human beings. It informs how we make our decisions in our life, whether or not there is intelligent life out there or it other worlds you we can live to. You said oh yeah, a lot helps of people. me. <laughs> right. Yeah, but I, I'm not the only person I think who thinks this. I think there's many of us who think this, and, yes, and I think that understanding that gives humans around the world a factual, objective information on which they can make their own decisions in their own personal life. Okay, now you've talked to students and done some outreach. What do you think mm -hmm. the, the biggest misconceptions about this question are among students or the public? I th um, well, I think a lot of people, I, I don't know, it's hard to say, right? So the biggest misconception, certainly there are many people who think that we've already found life. I think that's maybe the one that I find most striking is just that many people just already think it's out there, that we've already found lots of civilizations, and so I think that that's probably the most striking misconception. And I don't think that's a, a large fraction of people, but it is the one I think that stands out the most to me. Oh. And do you, try to, uh, do you try to correct that misconception? Sure, well, yeah, it's just a, it's a fact that we haven't found it. I mean, it doesn't mean it's not out there, but we haven't found it. But people think we have. People what think do you, we what have. Do you, what do you say to these people? Well, I tell them we haven't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and they say, yes, we have. No, 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 they just... 
No, they usually they take it at face value when I say like, oh, oh okay. And they just uh -huh. it was just uh, something that they had just thought we probably that. So it's an interesting. There's an interesting sociology there somewhere about just how it is that people do just naturally develop that instinctive belief or something or intuition that there is many other civilizations out there, but they just actually have no data point. They've never seen a picture or anything of this other worlds with these life, intelligent life forms on it, but yet they think that's the case. Do you think there's an intuition, a pathway through intuition, which you would assume that there's no life? Yeah, I think that there is. I think that it comes down to that feeling that you know, we are in a special preferred place, you know, and this has been something that has been handed down through society. It's almost for, religious people might. Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a one way to put it, but also there's a deep intellectual uh, history of this too, right, from ancient Greeks and beyond, that the earth is the center of the universe. And, and so I think that it's, I don't want to ascribe it just to being religious, but I think that there's definitely been a lot of very intelligent people through history who have assumed that um, through observation, and they were wrong in the end, but, you know, that's, I think that's a natural way to think about it. Now, do you have any advice for students who want to become astrobiologists and help answer the question, are we alone? Sure. Uh, you know, it's just uh, the first things I would say are to, to be passionate about it, to really be excited about it. You know, you have to find that joy within your, inside yourself that you do want to answer this question because you're not going to get famous or rich from doing this. But if you find personal fulfillment in it, that's valuable. So you have to decide if that's what you really want to do and really do think that that's exciting. And then the second thing is you just have to study things like physics and biology and chemistry to you know, learn what people have done already and, and kind of integrate yourself into the scientific community. So, But uh, I think it's definitely the first thing is to just explore it for yourself. Uh, just think about it in your own mind and you know, try and learn what you can just at an early age and just think about it and just decide if this is something that would be uh, exciting to do for the rest of your life. You said you wouldn't think of it as a way to become famous, but if somebody discovers life, won't they become famous? <laughs> True, but that's a very small fraction of people. <laughs> okay. Right, right. okay, and let me ask you again, are we alone? I don't know. <laughs> and the reason, why don't you know the answer to that? Because there's no data that supports that one way or the other. Okay. And or there's I, insufficient data, maybe I should say. <laughs>